Welcome to Conversations from St. Norbert College, a program that invites you into discussions taking place in your community on today's local and global issues. Now, your host for Conversations from St. Norbert College, the Dean and Academic Vice President of the College, Michael Marsden. Good evening, my name is Michael Marsden, and I'm your host for this edition of Conversations from St. Norbert College. Our very special guest this evening is Gwen Eiffel, moderator and managing editor of Washington Week and senior correspondent of the PBS NewsHour with Jim Lehrer. Upon graduation from Simmons College in Boston with a bachelor's degree in communications, Gwen went to work at the Boston Herald American, where she discovered her passion for journalism. Covering dis desegregation busing in the 1970s, later she worked for the Baltimore Evening Sun, the Washington Post, and the New York Times. After those assignments, she switched uh, to broadcast journalism and began working as the chief congressional and political correspondent for NBC News, along with her former boss and the late Tim Russert. Her first book, The Breakthrough, Politics and Race in the Age of Obama, was published in 2009 and has become a bestseller. Gwen, welcome to our program. We're really pleased to have you with us. Thank you, Michael. One of the questions I wanted to ask you is, when you first really decided that journalism was going to be your career? I think I was in the single digits. I was maybe nine years old. I loved to write. I loved to write stories. I loved to write about what I wanted to be when I grew up. And we read a lot of newspapers in our house. We watched the news. We were very much engaged in the world around us. So when you put those interests together, love of current events, mm -hmm. love of writing, and a need for a deadline. I needed someone to tell me when to get something done. I was very much drawn to newspaper journalism, and that's why I spent so much of my career at newspapers. Now, your first assignment was the Boston Herald American. Yes. And you covered a lot of the social unrest of that period. But according to what I read, you did a lot of it by phone. I did. I w how, when how, I, did how did that come about? Well, you know, I was a, a young black girl in a city that was wrestling with race, um, mm -hmm. and it was at war with itself at, in some ways in the 1970s. And when I started at the Boston Herald American, and I, I actually started just being a gopher and doing whatever I could to get a, a writing job, but when I start, started covering the school committee in Boston, it was a huge political story. I'm sure it was. And when there were still riots breaking out at high schools, there was still unrest in the streets. And I just knew it was just risky for me to go into certain areas of the city. And so we worked it out so that a white colleague would go on the scene and report on what he saw and then phone me back with the details in the and office the and I would work it by phone. That's the only way I could do it and stay safe. Okay, well, That's interesting. Now, you know, you early on, uh, I think, figured out the connection between race and poverty when a lot of other people missed that. Politics, yeah. And how, how no, but race and poverty in particular. Oh, and poverty. Uh -huh. Connected together. What led you to conclude that when everybody else seemed to be missing that? Well, I don't think I knew. I think that uh, after a while you accumulate enough experience that you begin to see the, the theme that uh, that emerges. I, You know, we didn't grow up rich in my, in my house, mm -hmm. and we knew that... There were things, we were coming of age at a time when, um, you know, Ro I was born the year that Rosa Parks sat down on that bus. Mm -hmm. My father marched in civil rights marches. He was, he was an African Methodist Episcopal minister. He, he saw, he saw the, the virtue in social justice theology. And so he brought home to our home this idea of you had to take action in order to improve your lives. And in our case, being raised as little black kids, we knew that improving our lives was also inextricably entwined with the question of race, race. which Condoleezza Rice called our great national uh, birth defect. And I think that's, that's really true. And rather than going around with a chip on your shoulder, he, he and my mother taught us that we could overcome that, but not because someone would just grant it to us, but because we had to work for it. But again, you know, getting more black entrepreneurs out there to develop businesses and to get involved in the economic structure is ultimately going to be part of the solution. That's it? certainly part of the solution, but part of it when I was growing up was also changing the laws to allow those black entrepreneurs Absolutely. to succeed. They, they, there, there were always black entrepreneurs, but they were always segregated into the black community. And here we were now in a more integrated place where the opportunities were broader. And once they were given opportunities that were backed up by laws that allowed them, um, and allowed you to move into neighborhoods you couldn't live in before and allowed you to um, open a business in an area where you were banned from before. These things were completely tied together. To make free enterprise available to all. Mm -hmm. Good point. Now, you've said that the new black politicians are fundamentally different than the black political leaders who really headed up the civil rights movement, mm -hmm. that there's been a sea change. The sea change is a result, actually, in some ways of those laws because when the first, uh, there were several waves of, of 
of black politicians, including pre-Reconstruction. But just starting in the 50s and 60s, right. there were black politicians who took charge and said, let's change and make lives better for the people we represent, which is what all politicians do. That's why you get elected in order to theoretically make represent the people who sent you there. So these elected officials, however, had to change laws, and they had to march, and they had to kind of yell in order to get heard and to, and to effect change. Their children, essentially, or their grandchildren now, came of age at a time when public accommodations laws were already on the books. It was presumed that fairness should be available to all, that separate but equal was a bad idea. And so you have now a generation who have come of age who are people who benefited from all of that. They got to go to Ivy League schools. They got to, they weren't barred from certain opportunities that other people had. And as a result, they came of age at a time when they thought, okay, they made the laws, now we can act on those laws. It's what Barack Obama calls the Joshua generation. Mm -hmm. Their parents were the Moses generation. They marched around Jericho, and the Joshua generation was able to walk through the walls. Interesting, yeah. Um, now, are they in some ways also, though, some sim there's, there's got to be some similarities between, you know, the civil rights leaders and the contemporary black politicians. Oh. As well as separations and differences. There's, there's, a, lot of, there's a lot of similarities, which is why you talk to any of these young breakthrough politicians who I talked to for this book, and they will all speak with great respect of the people who led the way. Mm -hmm. Obviously, they speak of great respect with about Martin Luther King, but also of Malcolm X. I was, I was interested to find out how many young, especially black males, who came of age at a certain point respected Malcolm X, including Clarence Thomas, who had a yes. picture of him on his wall, right. including Clarence Thomas and Barack Obama. How could these two people have seen the world the same way and, and the, the value of someone like Louis Farrakhan who said hateful things on one hand but also talked about self-empowerment mm -hmm. and, and self-respect. This is something that rang a real true bell for all of these younger, they're now in their 40s and 50s, but younger people who were coming behind. Who Almost were they read him differently, but they both responded. Absolutely. Yeah. It's interesting. Now, Jesse Jackson is, is a very interesting person for many, many reasons. But mm -hmm. when you talk about the sea change, I mean, you've got Jesse Jackson Sr. and Jesse Jackson Jr. Yeah. Sort of living out that whole issue, don't you? It was one of the most interesting things. When I started this book, I didn't even think I was going to write about this. But as I reported it, I discovered that there was a, a, a new generation of legacy politics which was happening in the African-American yes. community and that people like Jesse Jackson Sr. had given birth to children who were raised in his, his aura yeah. and who also saw that, that politics was a way to affect change. So Jesse Jackson Jr. and, and young men of his generation, all, they might, for instance, think that school vouchers are a good idea. Their parents thought it was Would a never, terrible right. idea. Uh, they, they might see ways that where they are more interested in being entrepreneurial and business oriented, while their parents were people who thought it was more important to speak and to exhort. And so they don't agree about everything. And they admit that they don't agree, agree about everything. And I, I always say I'd like to sit at their Thanksgiving table and fly on the wall and listen to the <laughs> listen fights to their they conversation, have. Yeah. yeah, because they don't agree, but they love each other. Yeah. And they respect each other's differences. Yeah, that is interesting because they're totally different politicians, that's for sure. Um, do you think Jesse Jackson Sr., that his two presidential campaigns made a huge difference in terms of uh, eventually Barack Obama's oh, campaign? Absolutely. I believe, uh, when I travel the country talking about this book, people say, you're not giving due respect to what Jesse Jackson did. And I, I completely disagree because, first of all, I cut my teeth in presidential politics largely covering Following Jesse him. Jackson's yeah. campaign, including here in Wisconsin in 19... I remember in 1988, he had won the Michigan campaign... The, primary and people said he's going to win Wisconsin. Oh my goodness, I can't mm -hmm. wait till I, let's go see. so they sent me to Wisconsin to find out the truth whether Jesse Jackson was going to win in Wisconsin. Was this 84 or 88? 88. 88. Okay. Not a chance that he was going to win in Wisconsin. I I could tell this just from what people said to me the moment I, I went to spend it spent a couple of days in Sheboygan where everything I heard led me to believe they weren't quite ready for Jesse Jackson. Jackson yet. Yeah. But yeah. other people were caught up in the romantic notion that he could suddenly transform and it was when I learned to trust my instincts, by the way, in journalism, <laughs> yeah. because I saw that that wasn't going to happen. But what he did, which, which people forget now, is when he's created his Rainbow Coalition, mm -hmm. by definition, that wasn't just black people. No. He, 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 got, votes, he went yeah. to Iowa, and he got an incredible amount of support among people who were all disenfranchised. I saw more in common with him, for instance, and Pat Robertson, another preacher 
who was clearly not like Jesse Jackson in his politics, but was like him in speaking to people who felt like no one was listening to them. Mm -hmm. Both of them went to audiences who no one had ever spoken to before and said, come, I will speak for you. And that paved the way. And that paved the way for Barack Obama. Yeah, that, that, I think that makes good sense. Now, by the 1980s, you moved to Washington mm -hmm. after Stinson, well, certainly Boston, but then Baltimore. Did that change your career in some profound ways when you, yeah. when you moved into Washington and that whole climate? I suppose it did, I, even though I have to say I didn't really think about it that way. By then, I really loved being a political reporter. I loved being in politics. And if you're going to follow the natural rhythm of how you cover politics, you want to cover national politics Truly, at some point. Yeah. But working for the Washington Post, at the time it was the Washington Post, which had, sure. you know, brought down Nixon and had done all of these amazing things and I just thought of it as the pinnacle of journalism. So I was happy to go to work for the Washington Post and secondarily to live in Washington. If you told me then that I'd still be there um, working as a journalist 20 years later, I would you tell wonder. you what? Yeah. Now you covered the White House for some yeah. period of time. I did. What, what, what was New that York, like? Well, I covered it for the New York Times. I, I, had, I worked at the Post for a while, and I went to work for the New York Times covering Bill Clinton in 1991, his campaign, and his first two years in the White House. And, um, you know, it's not at all it's, it's, cra it's cracked up to be covering the White House. I'm it's, sure not. It's a great <laughs> thing to have done because it teaches you about... Like, I've covered Congress and the White House, and I think in order to get Washington, you have to have covered uh, d departments, you have to have covered agencies, and also the politics of it. And if you understand the way everything integrates, you get the city better and you get the understanding of our national government better. But covering the White House itself could be very frustrating for a journalist. Then and now, the White House is mostly interested in controlling their message and not right. answering your questions. And so you spend a lot of time banging on, on doors. Right. How, how well did you get to know President Clinton? For a time, fairly well. Um, I, the one thing about covering him in early 1990s before we had blogs and easy internet access was that you spent a lot of time on small planes with only a few people and you and the candidate. And it was probably the last legacy of the Teddy White days where you actually got to know the person you were covering more. Mm -hmm. um, as it went on and his campaign caught fire, the press corps got bigger and bigger, mm -hmm. his entourage got bigger and bigger. But you still um, had the rootedness of having observed him up close in smaller environments. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I got to know him for a time as well as any reporter. And it was, um, I still find him one of the most fascinating people I've ever covered. Yeah. How do you explain his, his huge following in the black community? I mean, he really, he really had that um, and, of course, later caused mm -hmm. uh, almost a rift between you know, when, when his wife ran um, mm -hmm. for the campaign and against Obama, I mean, that caused a rift in the black community. But what, what was it about? Bill Part Clinton? of it was his upbringing. When he grew up in, um, in actually mostly in Hot Springs, Arkansas, his, his grandfather ran a store where he allowed black kids to buy penny candy. Uh, that, that, this was in a very segregated environment. Mm -hmm. And so he grew up understanding that, you know, there weren't horns and there wasn't t t devilment involved in knowing people of another race. And so he learned over his career in politics in Arkansas how to relate, how to speak, how to be equivalent with, with people of another background. And, and black folk can hear it when you're speaking to them and not at them. And so there was a certain authenticity which people embraced about him. And they transferred that as well to Hillary. But, but surely by dint of, Really, by dint of her being married to him, so they were going to ma they were going to support her because of Bill. That's what they all said. We uh, Andrew Young told me that. Well, as I was with Hillary because of Bill, but they hadn't considered the possibility of a of a black candidate. And then so many of them, including John Lewis from Georgia and Andrew Young, and so many of the civil rights era, you know, first blush politicians, they didn't know what to do with themselves. They loved Bill yeah. Clinton, but here they had the chance to elect a black president. So there was a lot of internal wars that went on. We're pretty conflicted. I want to come back to that in a minute, but I want to remind our, our viewers that you're watching Conversations from St. Norbert College. Our very special guest this evening is uh, Gwen Eiffel, internationally known journalist, television newscaster, and author. Our topic this evening is contemporary, the contemporary state of politics. Let's go back to, to both um, uh, Vernon Jordan, I think, and, and also Andrew Young, and mm -hmm. there are two um, among many who are probably caught up in that kind yeah. of conflict between what they would lo what they would like to support and what they felt that they were loyal to support mm -hmm. another candidate. You know, they had loyalty there. Uh, how how did they finally 
how does that get resolved? I talked to all of them about that. I, I remember having a conversation with Vernon Jordan and with Andrew Young about that. And the answers were very, in, in Vernon Jordan's case, it was pure loyalty, pure and simple. He knew mm -hmm. the Clintons. He was personal right. friends with them. And he wasn't going to, he told Barack Obama that. I, I like you. You're a fine fella. Hardly but, know you. But this guy is who I'm with. In the case of Andrew Young, he actually was very honest in, in saying after the campaign was over that his life experience had taught him disappointment. He didn't expect that America was ready. And so as far as he was concerned, this guy was a whippersnapper who was never going to make it. So why would he support yeah, him? Well, there were two kinds of readiness. One was whether Barack Obama was ready and whether the country was ready. Well, and a lot of the fear was whether the country was ready. I, I, t I can't tell you how many, especially older black people I talked to, who were not, not names you would recognize, just regular folk who said, I'm afraid that they're going to hurt him. I'm afraid that there, there's going to be an assassination attempt. Or They feared for his life. They mm -hmm. didn't think America was ready to embraced such a radical change. It was their children who believed it. The children who they had raised to believe that anything was possible, because that's what you do for your children, mm -hmm. who said, well, mom and dad, didn't you just tell me everything was possible? What about this guy? Right. And that I saw so many cases where children radicalized their parents. Interesting. Yeah, it was very interesting. But just a few years before, Colin Powell didn't think the country was ready. Right? His wife didn't think his the, wife the, didn't. The, the, the country was ready. But he also... When he, when he was right down, came right down to it, said he didn't have the fire in the belly. Mm -hmm. Race aside, you have to really, really want to be president because it's really hard to do it and it's really hard to run. And you have to be willing to give up a lot. And he just realized he had, he had never run for a he had never run for office. Cross. He had um, he had never aspired to a political life, and he had aspired to a military life, which he 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 excelled at. So he wa he was seeking leadership of a different kind, but not politics. So it wasn't a question of the country, but the country could have been ready. I don't know. I don't know. It's hard. I have to say, I didn't know the country was ready last time. Mm -hmm. I was also slow uh, on the uptake about whether America could get past the idea of race to vote for someone based on their own interest if they mm -hmm. thought that was their best interest. Yeah, but it happened. It did. It happened. Um, it's a little unfair, but I mean, in your book, uh, we mentioned the breakthrough politics and race in the age of Obama. Uh, you talk about the fact that um, this was a very important race uh, for the country, and uh, you're eloquent about that. Mm. I'm just wondering if and this is a little unfair because I'm going to say 20 years from now, do you think you'll still have the same point of view about what was most important about that race? I hope not. I hope not. I, I think, as, especially as a, as a journalist and a reporter, I hope that my eyes are always open for the possibility of a different interpretation of any set of events. Mm -hmm. If I've discovered anything as I've been talking about this book to different audiences is that people are ready to change the way they think about things if they have an opportunity to have a conversation about it. And so this book has provided me so many opportunities to be in rooms and in settings where people don't want to talk about the politics so much as they want to talk about the way we talk about race. Right. And that means that broadens our understanding. And the more that happens, the more I hope that a lot of the assumptions we have now seem quaint in 20 years. Sure. But um, let's, let's talk about the year and a half since the, since the election. Mm -hmm. has, has your perspective changed at all? Well, it has in some respects, but not the race part, because I, I, I've i covered politicians long enough to know that they do what they need to do in order to get what they think they need to get done done. Sometimes it's self-protection. Sometimes it's doing great things for the country. Sometimes it's their certainty that health care for all is a basic right. Whatever it is, it's how they handle it, which is worth watching. Mm -hmm. And Barack Obama, had we have, he had nothing to gauge whether he would be good at this or not. No, that's he, true. He had never been, um, he had been a state senator only a few years before he became president. So the idea that he would be as tough as he's turned out to be about some things, as nakedly political as he's turned out to be about other things, that was probably all there for us to see, but we did, hadn't seen him for long. So it's been interesting watching him evolve as a, an international leader and watching how his qualities um, apply on this kind of stage. There's no way we would have been able to see it or, or gauge yeah, it before. There was, no, there was no test of no. that pattern, no. know, ultimately. It's true. Um, yeah, you, in your book, you talk about Roger Wilkins as someone that I had gotten to know as well. Um, but and I was always fascinated by his experience as a young attorney working with the Johnson administration during, during the height of the civil rights uh, movement. Um, but how does someone, do you think, like Roger Wilkins deal with all this change? I mean, just 
Can, can we project out how someone like that would? Oh, yes, because I've talked to him about it. Mm -hmm. I, I saw Roger Wilkins not long ago. We were both <coughs> going to the White House for an event um, uh, during Black History Month. It was a, a civil rights concert, a concert featuring Joan Baez and mm. Smokey Robinson and Jennifer Hudson and, you know, the five blind boys of Alabama and, and Sweet Honey and the Rock. It was wonderful. You're in the East Room of the mm -hmm. White House, and you can't imagine. My parents are spitting in their graves somewhere. Mm -hmm. But I ran into him outside, and we were talking about it. And the one thing that Roger Wilkins told me straight out during the campaign and still believes, he said, listen, this is great, but my time is gone. I'm old. <laughs> it's time now for another generation to pick up where we left off. We created this possibility for these younger folk to step up. And he is completely embracing of the notion that people who, and he's not terribly old, but he thinks that he's in his 70s, he's in his 70s yeah. but he believes it's time for him. He's done his work. And it's time for his children and other people's children to pick up where they left off. Yeah, interesting. Well, I think, you know, Roger himself, I think, has now become the senior statesman, the philosopher, the historian. You the know, philosopher the, king. The philosopher like king at that point. <laughs> <laughs> now, despite concerns uh, among those who suggest that somehow we've transcended race um, that in this country instead of embracing it and so on, um, and there are others who, on the other side, of the, say we're, we're experiencing a new kind of racism in mm -hmm. the country, you know. Um, at the end of the book, <clears throat> you're very optimistic. You know? mm -hmm. You're optimistic about the future of race. Um, now, you temper that by talking about patience, and that's uh, you know, tempering there. Um, but what do you honestly see as the future of race issues in this country, particularly within politics? Well, it's a good question because <laughs> I have to say my, my thinking has evolved over time. I mean, I do not believe that we can transcend, but I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. I think it's possible for us to see race but not see it as a negative. To have a conversation about race that's not about conflict, mm -hmm. and if we could only get to that point, we th this country could be the, the the mosaic quilt it likes to think of itself as. As diversity is is something which has now become kind of a, a toss off word. People don't even know what it True. means anymore. True. But I think diversity is about diversity of thought, opinion, and experience, as well as about skin color. And the more that we talk across these lines that we create for ourselves, these little borders where we only talk to people who agree with us or people who share our political uh, uh, assumptions or people who share our, our rural upbringing or our urban upbringing or our skin tone, then the, the, the more stuck we're going to stay mm -hmm. in, in old arguments. I think in talking to young people, they want to get past those arguments. They really do, more than almost people of my generation do. I'm in my 50s, but I think that people in, my, in their 30s are in a completely different place than I am in lots of respects. And so that's why I stay hopeful, partly because I'm innately optimistic, but partly because I think how far we've come just in the 40 years of this, just since the civil rights movement, as, as people call it, ended since the laws were passed. Look how far we are. Mm -hmm. So how much farther do, can we go in the next 40? So that's why I, I stay optimistic. Well, that's, a, that's a very good message. Wondering uh, on a personal level, you know, with all the things that you do with Washington Week and, and uh, Jim Lehrer Report, how, how do you, and all the other things, you're, you're writing, you're serving on boards, how do you keep balance in your life? How do you, <laughs> how do, you do it? I have, um, I am <clears throat> fortunate and blessed to have a very good core of family and friends who create, we create for ourselves our own little backup. Mm -hmm. um, even if you're working really hard, there's always someone who will t come and say, come, I'm coming to get you. Or if, even if you think that you're frustrated in whatever little thing you're frustrated, you had a fight at work or you had a fight at home or whatever it is, there's always a, a, a great backup. I think everybody needs that. I, it's it's um, it's a blessing. I, I also have a very deep spiritual core. I I don't believe I was given all these things just for nothing. I believe that I was put in this position because I have um, a message that I'm supposed to be carrying, mm -hmm. and I have a, an image I'm supposed to be. When I meet young girls, especially young black girls, and they've never seen anything like me on television, and even after all these years, they still look at me and go, oh, you look like me. That's I can do that, too. I take very seriously that responsibility, so I don't feel burdened by the busyness. I just try to stay focused on what's worth doing, what's worth focusing on, and then stop, go hang out with my friends, <laughs> relax, right. crack some crabs on the back porch, and, and keep life in perspective. Oh, that, that's good. That's a good message indeed. Uh, one of the things I wanted to ask you about, because you 
um, were the moderator for the 2004 and 2008 yes, vice presidential was. debates. Those must have been incredible experiences. Very. Just, I mean, I can only imagine. As you know. George H.W. George Bush would say, tension city. Tension city. <laughs> yeah. What, Actually, did you, what did you learn from those experiences? I learned, um, well, the, the, there were very different kinds of debates. The first <laughs> one which, with Cheney and Edwards, which I guess the questions would be different now, wouldn't they? they? Would indeed. <laughs> Both yeah. of them. Yeah. But the first one, I, I learned an interesting thing, which is that even if they don't answer the question you pose. People at home are pretty smart, yeah, and they they'll, figure they'll figure out. out. They'll figure it out. And I that I used that because it was a question I asked them about HIV/AIDS in, in the domestic in in, in the U.S. And they, mm-hmm. neither of them could really answer the question. They didn't hadn't thought about that, which I thought was very enlightening yes. in lots of ways. And lot, I got a lot of feedback to that to that effect. So four years later, when Sarah Palin looked at me and said, I don't need to answer the moderator's questions, a lot of people said, yes, why do. didn't you get mad at her? Why didn't you shake your finger? And I thought, because it would have then been boiled down to a cat fight between me and her. It would have been a right. huge distraction when I trusted people watching it to know and to take from it what they needed to take from it and to learn about her. Mm-hmm. Vice presidential debates are different from presidential debates in that there's only one. Right. every cycle. You have to cover all issues, foreign and domestic politics and everything. And you have to explain to people at home in some way, this is who would run the country if something terrible Happened were to, to happen to the president. And so it's a different kind of choice that people are making. They're not voting for the vice president, they're voting for the president. So you, but so the job is to inform as much as you can. And you know, this one was this last one was amazing because I became a subject of the of attack uh, because of that. this very I book. I remember it because of the book. Yeah, they thought that you were going to be one sided. Yeah, they thought I was writing a pro Obama, you know, book, which I have to, it should be said I hadn't written it yet. Right. I hadn't even written the Obama chapter yet. So I knew that they were wrong, and I knew they were trying to game the ref. So I let a lot of it slide off my back, but it did make the scrutiny uh, much greater. Um, tellingly, they stopped talking about it the minute. The debate was over, and the minute the book came out. But the control issue there is that you really do have to remain in control. You do. And that must be very difficult. You spend a lot of time thinking about what the audience doesn't see, which is how much time is allowed, that there are equivalent amounts of time given for each candidate, that you're su- covering as many subject, as much subject matter as you can in a limited amount of time. There's a lot uh, going on. Now, I know that the vice presidential candidates prepare for those very seriously. Mm-hmm. Um, do you, I'm sure, spend a lot of time a lot of time. as well preparing? First time I was invited to moderate a, a national debate, I went to Jim Lehrer, my boss, and said, he's <clears> done about 10 of them by then. Now he's done a dozen. And I said, what do I do? Mm-hmm. And he said, whatever you do, keep your questions to yourself, because they've got people whose full-time job it is to figure out what it is you want to ask. Uh-huh. And I took him seriously on that. So I spent a lot of time reading, a lot of time compiling hundreds of questions, some of which I threw out, some of which I rewrote, <clears> some of which I I shifted the order right up until a couple of days before the debate. It was a real, it was a real challenge. It was as hard as anything I've ever done. I can imagine. And um, I remember I was only participating in, in one. Um, it was when I was in an earlier point in my career. But um, at that particular point, Lieberman was uh, preparing, and he actually came to our campus and spent the week preparing for the ah. debate because the debate was then at Center College. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we got to watch it kind of up close. And yeah. It was interesting to see it, but I can only imagine what the pressure must be on you as a moderator. You know, it is, if you let it. I mean, it really is possible to, to shut as much of it out as possible. Um, and that's a perfect example where friends come in handy. They just shut me down. They wouldn't let me read blogs or watch cable or anything in the days leading up to debate so I could stay focused, and yeah. which was a good thing. Oh, I imagine so. I'm sort of interested in what your next writing project might be. I mean, you, <laughs> Me too. This has been such a success and so, so informative. Oh, well, What's you next? Know, I don't know. I, I learned one thing about writing this book, which is if you're going to write a book, it's got to be something that you don't mind haunting your dreams, because this mm-hmm. did haunt my dreams. It's got to be something that you feel such passion about, that you want to think about it all the time, and you want it to absorb your complete life. I managed to write this book while covering a historic presidential campaign, while hosting and, and reporting for two different television programs mm-hmm. while trying to still have an actual life. And so it was completely consuming, and it's, I'd like to do it again, but not quite. Not right, right. now. <laughs> <And> <laughs> right not now. right now. Have you had any good feedback from uh, people like the president? Oh, yeah. Well, I, I know the president has a copy of the book, but he have never asked him what he thought about it because we have to keep our little arm's length relationship. Sure. I thought maybe he might send you a note or something. <laughs> <laughs> Just thanking me for the book. That's good. No, that's good. I'd like to thank our very special guest, Gwen Eiffel, for sharing her expertise with us this evening. Please join us for future programs as we continue to explore the world of ideas. Until then, I'm Michael Marsden for Conversations from St. Norbert College.